There is Micah. So he's getting involved once again. I thank God that God's not a God that is simply up in heaven, uh, completely not involved with, with, with our human issues. He is always involved. But he is, he's getting involved in what the people of Israel have been doing. But the message is that after they receive their judgment, after they receive judgment, there will be a glorious restoration of it all. That there will still be a, a restoration that God still has something better at the end. So, even though my, what I just shared with you might be discouraging, it might be discouraging to, to hear that, that if America, uh, if the world continues to go against the, the, the ways of God, if, if America continues to uh, disobey his word, uh, then the judgment will come. That, that is inevitable. It will come. It will happen. Um, the Bible tells us that in the, in the last days, um, the, the day of the Lord will happen. The day of the Lord is the day of judgment. Uh, by that time, the Bible does teach us that us as Christians, we will be with him. We will be, we will be spared from having to go through that judgment. But the judgment will come upon America. The judgment will come upon the rest of the nations of the world. The judgment will come. And so, but after the judgment comes restoration. After, after the judgment comes Christ and he will reign over this land, over, over this world, over the nations of the world. Every nation will bow down to the king of kings and lord of lords. There will be one kingdom. There will be one throne and, and that will belong to Jesus. So that will happen. There will be a restoration. But before that, there will come judgment. And so uh, that's what this message to the book of Micah, the people of Micah, uh, the one that he writes to, it is, it is being written to. It is saying that there will come judgment, but there will be restoration. And so I wonder if we ever ask ourselves the question, are the trials that I'm going through, are they actually going to be worth it? Are they worth all of the pain? And, and if we're honest, I think that we all have asked that question. Is all of this worth it? Is all the pain, all the... Whether it's sicknesses, whether it's problem with family, uh, problems in a marriage, problems with children, uh, problems in church with other Christians. Uh, is all the trials and tribulations that we go through, will it actually be worth it at the end? Uh, or is this trial uh, actually leading me to something? Is this test actually going to teach me something? And of course, the answer is yes. God does have a plan. God does have a plan, and we trust in that. That's all we got at the end of it. At the end of it all, we have to trust that God has a plan and that all things work together for the good. That even though right now, uh, whether again it's as an individual, maybe as, as a family, you feel like you're in a trial, maybe as a nation and, and the nations of the world right now, we feel like uh, everything's kind of falling apart. But... At the same time, I feel like we have to just remember that God has a plan at the end of it. And so let's look at Micah. And this is the message in Micah. Uh, and really on the three books that we're going to look at tonight. Um, and don't worry, the books are very short. Micah is the longest. And so we're going to go quickly. Uh, Micah means who is like God. So the word Micah. So that's a nice, that's a, of all the Old Testament names, there are some good names that you can name your, your baby, you can name the children. Uh, Micah. And so, Micah, who is like God? In other words, there's no one else. There is nothing or no one like our God. And Israel at this point in their history, once again, has enemies that are, are oppressing them. Specific yeah, enemies. Three enemies. Uh, they have rulers. They have rulers or kings that have been harassing them. They have had very wealthy people who are exploiting them. The, the wealthy, the rich, taking advantage of them. And then there's also enemies, other, other nations that are coming against them. Specifically at this point, it's the Assyrians that want to come and take the north side uh, of, of, of Israel. So remember, this is in every book. It is, it is the history of Israel. Israel was one kingdom, one nation. It was the nation of Israel, uh, the kingdom of Israel under, under David and Solomon. After, after Solomon dies, the next kings become so evil. There is a separation between the two. Uh, the Israel becomes so weak because now there is the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And so the, the nation, there is no more kingdom. It's just the two different kingdoms. And because they're separated and arguing between one another, it almost reminds you once again of our nation right now. There is the kingdom of the Democrats and the kingdom of the Republicans. And so there is this separation. And when there is so much separation, when there 
there's so much division, a nation becomes weak and enemies can come against us. And so at that time, the Assyrians were about to attack. And so Micah chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Joph Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, king of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Now, Moresheth, so it says that Micah, Micah is from Moresheth. That's about 20 miles south of Jerusalem. Okay, just so you can imagine, there's Jerusalem, but he is from a small town south of Jerusalem. Now look at the, the prophecy that God is speaking through Micah, and this is in verse 2. It says, hear all you peoples. And the, kind of like, you know, you've seen the movies and the stories, hear ye, hear ye. And so that's what he's doing. Hear all you peoples. So this is, a, this is a national message, not just for one person, but of all of Israel. Listen, O earth. He's saying not just Israel, but all the nations and all that is in it. Let the Lord God be wit a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place. He will come down and tread on high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him and the valleys will split like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. Like, I mean, just look at the imagery. The, the Lord speaks to prophets with imagery, with, with symbolism, so that the people can understand it better. He's saying, Israel, you think you've become so arrogant and so prideful, and you think that you're powerful, that you think that everything, nothing could touch you. Well, listen, you're going to be like wax to the fire. You're going to melt. You're going you're gonna to fall apart. The enemies are going to come and destroy you. And this is the transgression of Jacob, verse 5. And for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of, uh, of Jacob? Is, is not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? So he specifically speaks. He, he brings up, or God brings up Samaria, Jerusalem. Again, the, the kingdom is divided. The northern kingdom, the capital, the biggest city is Samaria. The southern kingdom, the capital, biggest city is Jerusalem. And so he's basically saying from the north and from the south, the whole nation, the whole kingdom, all of you have, are living in transgression or are living in sin. You have rebelled against God. And so he's speaking out specifically in the northern, it's, it's Samaria. There was so much idolatry there. There were, uh, again, this is the people of God that asked for, for God's help to be freed from slavery out of, out of Egypt. And they, remember when they came out, out in the desert, in the wilderness, while Moses is up on the mountain, he's receiving the Ten Commandments, and they're down there building themselves an idol and worshiping him. And then for 40 years, they, they, they're out in the desert, and for 40 years, they finally they recognize we don't need idols, we just need our one and true God, that's all we need. God gives them the promised land, God gives them a kingdom, they become powerful, rich, wealthy, even financially. Uh, the other nations are looking at them and saying, wow, what's the secret? King David, King Solomon, they both say it's God. God's favor. God is on our side. God is protecting us. Uh, Yahweh God, the, the God of Israel, no other God like our God. We don't need your idols. Years pass by, centuries pass by. They start worshiping their idols. So much idolatry. They want to worship the same idols as the other nations. They start marrying the other, the other nations. They start allowing uh, the wives of the other nations to uh, raise their Jewish children. So again, they're going to raise them worshiping uh, the other idols, worshiping other gods. And so at this point, the Assyrians will come in and take over the northern kingdom of Israel. He tells them this is what's going to happen. So the Syrians come in. Uh, and remember... Uh, this every every prophet brings this up. Judah is spared for another 150 years, and so for 150 years they were again thinking, "Well, that's not going to happen to us." That happened to the liberal Assyrian or, or the liberal Northern Kingdom of Israel. The Judah, the the, the 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 Kingdom of Judah in the south is saying we're much more conservative. We've actually honored the Lord and. No one's going to be able to come against us, even though they were also falling to idolatry and mostly to religious pride. The northern kingdom, they were just liberals, just with, with the, with the other, other gods. And so for 150 years, God says, it's going to happen to you too. It's going to happen to you too. Stop rebelling. Stop sinning. 
And, well, 150 years later, it's not the Assyrians, but Babylonians come and take over, take over the north and the south. And so the northern kingdom is always a warning to the south, but they still don't listen. And so for both kingdoms, the heartbeat of the southern kingdom is Jerusalem. The heartbeat of the northern kingdom is Samaria. God, in, in his wisdom, he brings up the two cities. It's kind of like for us in the United States, both coasts, the west coast, the east coast. Whatever happens on, on both sides affects the rest of the city, the rest of the nation. Uh, so you could say for us, we have L.A. and New York. So whatever happens in New York City, uh, whatever happens in L.A., will eventually affect the rest of the nation. It's, it's kind of the, the same way. And so God is saying, both of these cities, Samaria and Jerusalem, you are rotten in sin. And because of you two cities, the rest of the nation, both kingdoms, the south and north, are being affected by the sin. And so look at now chapter 2, verse 2. It speaks about how the wealthy are oppressing the poor. Uh, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, God has a special heart for the poor in his, in his heart. Um, sadly, there's been many Christians today that, that uh, will even dare to say this. I don't know if you ever heard a preacher say, if you are living in poverty, it's because you're living in sin. That, that somehow because um, you, you don't have the, the right job, and you're, you're not living in the, in the big house, and you're not driving a big car, and you don't have all the money in the bank account. Oh, it's because you're in sin. That if you were not living in sin, then God will make you rich. I don't know where that, because it, here it tells us that, that that's not how it works. That, that we need to take care of the, of, the, of the poor. That we need to take care of the widows. That we need to take care of, of the child, the, the fatherless, the orphans. And, and so he's, he's very clear on that. It's, it's taking care of them. And so he has a heart for the poor. Uh, and so in chapter 2, verse 2, they covet fields and take them by violence, who? The rich. Also houses and seize them. Now, this isn't saying that the, being rich now is a sin either. It's just saying if you are rich, if you are poor, whatever it is, treat others the way you want to be treated, but also treat others the way you, you know, in a godly way. But these rich, they're oppressing a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. In other words, the upper class are hurting the lower class. The lower poor class, verse 3. Therefore says the Lord, Behold, against this family I am devising a disaster from which you cannot remove your necks, nor shall you walk haughtily, for this is an evil, evil time. So again, uh, the rich, poor, Jewish also, uh, within their own people, they are, they are oppressing each other. So it's not just the Assyrians or Babylonians later, it's within Israel themselves, mistreating one another. And God's saying, I detest this, I'm angry against this, this is wrong. Uh, but, again, going back to taking care of the poor, taking care of, of uh, the dignity of humans. This is what it says. Uh, back in the law uh, of the book of Moses, remember the first five books of the Bible in the law, um, in Deuteronomy, when we studied Deuteronomy, God protected landowners, so when you own land. So, uh, when you had difficult times, they would have to sell their land and would have to go to another family. So it was just, that's just how it was. That's how it is today. Uh, or you would become so poor that you would become a servant or a slave. Uh, biblical slavery is not, not at all the way we think of slavery in the United States. It was, that was like a forced slavery. You, they took people from their land. They took people from, from African nations and forced them into slavery. Uh, biblical slavery is, is very different. Biblical slavery is basically you're working uh, because you owe someone something. And so it will take many years of working, of servanthood, uh, and you have a master. And so you have to work it off. But uh, God expected the master to take care of, of, of his slave or his servant. There was also um, that respect for the servant. Uh, so, so God would have to deal with the masters if they were in sin, um, taking advantage of their servants. And so it's very different. Sadly, American uh, slave owners, they would use the Bible to excuse themselves. And say, Look, it's in the Bible. There's slavery in the Bible. God says to honor your master. So why wouldn't we have slaves? 
It's very different from the way uh, Jewish Israel people understood slavery. They knew that I owed you money, I'm going to work it off. Sometimes it's, I want your daughter. <laughs> I love your daughter, and I want to marry your daughter. And, and what do I need to do? Well, the father would say, well, you need to give me 20, 20 oxen and, and camels and, and some land. Well, I don't have that. What else can I do? Well, you got to work for my, in my farm, in my harvest for seven years. And then, okay, I'll do that. So that's how much you, you showed how much you actually love that girl. And so that's how, that's how uh, uh, slavery was back then. So God would protect that. But what's so beautiful about the way God planned it out is that because, remember, that land was given to specific people, specific families. Uh, it was split up among the 12 tribes of Israel. And so that promised land was for each one of the families. And so if you lose that family, God still had a plan, so, uh, not the family, but the land, your family's land. God still had a plan for you to get it back. So you would plant and you would harvest for six years, and the seventh year you would do nothing. How nice would that be? Think about how wise that would be, even for us today, that people in the United States today in the year 2020, we get so uh, stressed out because of work. And we're trying to work and we're trying to make more money and more money and more money. And, and uh, you talk to any billionaire, what are they going to say? What's your next goal? To retire, to relax, to buy another boat? No, it's to make another bill. Because once they get one bill, they want more. They want more and more and more. And, and the way God had it planned, even for us today, he has a plan for us. It's in the Ten Commandments, right? A day, a Sabbath day of rest. And so we work six days, and we better take a, a, a seventh day off and rest and worship and, and get energized physically, spiritually, and then we get back to work for another six days. That's how, that's how God planned it out. And, and again, today, we just overwork seven days a week, seven days a week. And, and back then, though, it was you work for six years, and you save up for six years so that the seventh year, you just live on what you saved up on. And a whole year off from working. Wouldn't that be nice? And that's how, I mean, I was thinking of that. Wow. I mean, it would take a lot of planning and, and administering and, and saving up for six years so that you, you can take a, a seventh year off. And so uh, uh, there's some pastors that, that, are, that, that, that ask me, they're like, uh, uh, when was the last time you took a sabbatical? Like three months off from working, from preaching, from teaching. And I'm like, sabbatical? What is that? What language is that? Uh, you know, you got to keep working, you got to keep serving, you got to keep doing it. And so, no, that the way God planned it out is for, for them to be able to work for six years. The seventh year is off, but then, not just that. There was a seven cycles. And so seven times seven, that's 49 years. So after 49 years of, even if you were a slave, even if you had debts. By the 50th year, there was the year of Jubilee. You've heard of the year of Jubilee. And so all the debts... All that, so if you were a slave during, during that 50th year, you were automatically set free, and you start fresh. And, and that's the way God established it. So even if you lost your land on the year of Jubilee, you got it all back. And so, yeah, you worked for uh, 20 years, 30 years. Maybe you had to work for 49 years. But by the 50th year, the year of Jubilee, it's all yours back. And so, uh, um, but now... Those in power, by the time Micah writes this, those in power were just taking advantage of the poor. Is there a question? How were the people being uh, the lifespan back then about? Was it? Yeah, that's another thing too. Uh, usually, usually men they live till about forty some years. But so it wasn't it wasn't you as uh, so you didn't have to be fifty years old. It, it was just um, in the calendar. And the, so every 50 years, so whenever it, the, the year started, and it kept going. So uh, technically, the year 1970, I think it was 1976 was the last time. No, no, no. 1967 was the last Jubilee year. And then 2017 was another Jubilee year. So, so I mean, technically, you could go back the calendars and go back to this time. And every 50 years. And so, yeah, most men, uh, women, they, they, until around 50 years old, men are around 40-something. So when you think of the disciples as being young men uh, uh, or older men, they were, they were like early 20s uh, when they were with Jesus. Uh, yeah, so they were in their early 20s. Uh, but back, back then, that was middle age. And so by 40, 50 years old, 
except for, for like uh, uh, John, uh, he survived till he was 80. And then so, so by the time of John and, and some of these guys, uh, uh, even with the Apostle Paul, they're a little bit older. But anyway, so again, the rich were oppressing the poor by this time of Israel. And so Israel is, is they're just living in sin. And, and chapter 3, verse 4. So as a, as a punishment, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets now. Not just the rich, but now the prophets themselves, the, the, the ones that should be the religious leaders. Who make my people stray, wow, who chant peace while they chew their, their teeth, but who prepare war against him, who puts nothing into their mouths. So, when it says who chant peace, these were prophets that the prophet Jeremiah was upset about. The prophet Jeremiah was saying, God, why are you telling me to say this, that there is going to come another nation to attack us? Well, all these prophets are saying, hey, everything's great. God loves us. There is no problem. We're not going to talk about sin. We're just going to talk about God's love. And Jeremiah was saying, but God, you're telling me to preach about sin and about the wrath of God? People hate me. People want to kill me. The other prophets want to kill me. And so why were these prophets not preaching the truth? Because it was better for them. They were more popular. They were also getting more fi finances because of it. Uh, Thank God things have changed in the year 2020. No, no, no. We still have uh, prophet liars. We still have prophets who profit from the church that will preach about, hey, you come to church, you get rich, you get blessings, you, you're just, everything's going to go great. Everything's great. If you come to my church, there's no problems. You're in sin. No, we don't. You wouldn't use that word. We don't talk about sin. We don't. We don't talk about those things. You're just going to talk about God's love and God's grace, and and it's fine. We're all going to heaven anyway. It doesn't matter how you act. And so, so again, then you got other pastors preaching about sin, preaching about the judgment of God, and churches are empty. And so, um, it's it's not a coincidence. And so, here they're they're eating well. This is what Micah saying. He's saying you are eating well spiritually even, but you're not feeding anybody. And so there's two dangers now. There's, there's, there's these two dangers from the outside and from the inside. There's, there's uh, the wolves outside, uh, the, 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 the rich are oppressing the poor, and then the, the false shepherds on the inside. It's all gone bad. And so verse 6, there shall, Therefore you shall have night without vision, and you shall have darkness without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets, and the day shall be dark for them. So the seers shall be ashamed, and the diviners uh, uh, abashed. Indeed, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. So the prophets will not prophet, uh, pro prophesy anymore. God will not speak through anymore through them. Uh, maybe this is uh, a, a prophecy of 400 years between the Old Testament and New Testament. 400 years, no prophets. 400 years of, of darkness. That's why it says, uh, the verses we read right now, there's going to be darkness without vision. Uh, for 400 years, there wasn't any prophet that would stand up and say, this is what God is telling us right now. It was just 400 years of them living under the Roman Empire and, and, and Babylon and just um, under... Just completely just lost. They had nowhere to go. They, they had no, there was no one saying, this is what God is saying. Not until... Uh, John the Baptist began to prophesy, and then Jesus began to teach. But verse 12 says, Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed like a field. Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins, and the mountains of the temple, and then the mountain of the temple, like the bare hills of the forest. So again, saying the other nations are going to come and destroy it all. Yes, sister. Yes. Now, a prophet of God will see a blessing coming to the soul of the you know, of God, and he will tell them the blessing. Uh -huh. No, 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 no. Don't claim it, don't receive it, and then they will see. Amen. Amen. And so, so there, there will be, yeah, false prophets that, that, uh, that go against God's word. 
And so they'll say that things are, even the negative things, but does it really go to what the Bible says? Amen. Amen. And, they, and they take advantage of fear to try to manipulate people and say, and say uh, uh, to, live, to keep people, because as long as you keep people in, in fear, then, then uh, uh, you can control them. And so that's, that's, how, that's how it is. And so uh, the nation of Israel began, again, like I, like I said, as, as one nation under God. The United States, again, began as one nation under God. Um, maybe you saw this, I posted this, this quote earlier on Facebook as I was studying for this. And I was thinking, wow, this is, this is uh, sad. This is very shocking. And hopefully we take this as a warning. Uh, us as Americans, we say, God we trust. Uh, and so back in 1643, uh, before the Declaration of Independence was written, back when it was just uh, the, the colonies, and so it was called the New England Confederation, and it was the Constitution that they wrote for themselves uh, before it became the United States. And this is what it says. The first sentence, it says, Whereas we all came into these parts of America with one and the same end and aim. In other words, the same goal. Namely, to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and to enjoy the liberties of the gospel and purity with peace. Wow. That was then. And that is not now. At least not the way um, most Americans still, you know, they hope and think uh, to try to still place Jesus. Place, you know, they'll say God. They'll say, oh, yes, yes, I believe in God. Well, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Well, I try not to be very divisive. I, all, I, I care about all gods. Okay. Well, uh, do, they, do we really trust in God? Do we trust more in, in gold? Or some may trust more in the government? Or, uh, but are we really trusting in God? What's good is that there are some better promises coming for Israel. And like I said, yes, there is the negative. There is the judgment. But there are better, better promises. Chapter 4 of Micah is beautiful because... It's, it's basically uh, giving us an answer after the judgment comes. Now it says in verse 1, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days, in other words, in the, in the end times, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow to it. Speaking about not just the temple, but about that, that throne of Christ. Many nations... Come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. The mountain of the Lord was a was another nickname for Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem is literally on a mountain top. And then like I mentioned on Sunday, uh, uh, Mount Moriah, the mountain, that's where the temple was on top of it. Uh, so to the house of God of Jacob, he will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion, Zion, the law shall go forth. We see that. It says many nations shall come and say, we say, hey man, that's beautiful. All the nations coming to, to meet the Lord. Even a prophecy like that to the Israelites at that time, it was offensive. What do you mean the nations? No, we, this is our God. This is our temple. This is, this is, the, we are his holy people. And, and, uh, but we see throughout the Old Testament. God always wanted the nations to come in. And so, uh, verse 3, And he shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That there will be a time that there, will be any more, there won't be any more war. There will be complete peace. Again, when is that happening? That's after when Christ comes. We call it the millennial kingdom when Jesus comes and will reign on this earth and all these things will be passed. This is, this is after the Antichrist. This is after the Great Tribulation. This is after every, you know, uh, Armageddon, all of that. This is, this is after all that. This is the great millennial kingdom here on earth. And so Jesus will do this. This is all prophecy from that. And so, but look at in chapter 5. Chapter 5 is where we see I hope that you see something beautiful here. I'm not even going to spoil it for you. But chapter 5, beginning in verse 2. Micah, Micah is prophesied specifically speaking now, and he's saying, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrath, Ephrathah. Okay, Ephrathah. Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Now, Ephrathah, it's kind of like saying the county. So it's kind of like saying Stockton, San Joaquin. So, uh, because there was two Bethlehems back then, one in the north, one in the south, 
The one in the south is, is, is Bethlehem Ephrathah, but then the, the one in the north is Bethlehem Zebulun. So right here, he's talking about the one in the south, south in Judah. And so Bethlehem means the house of bread. It's also the city of David, but the house of bread. And Ephrathah is fruitful, or like the fruitful county. So it's, it's saying to you, little Bethlehem, house of bread and fruitful county. Now, that sounds beautiful. Because something good is coming out of Bethlehem. Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, among all the big cities, you're little, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one. Look at that it's capitalized though. The one to be ruler, capital R, in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. So he's talking about the future ruler of Israel, born in the house of bread, in the fruitful county. This prophecy is 700 years before Jesus, and it's speaking about this small place, Bethlehem, that this is where Jesus or the Messiah will be born. Now, how do you get these two people from Nazareth, that live in Nazareth, to go and have a baby born in, in, uh, in a town that no one really goes there? It's a small little town. It's, it's just famous because uh, the little shepherd boy named David, who later becomes king, is from the same place, but it's 90 miles away from Nazareth, and that's where uh, Mary and, and Joseph are, and they're, they're, but we know that they're both from the family of King David, and an emperor in Rome says, I, I want to count how many people are in my empire, like we talked about on, on Sunday, he wanted to have a census, and so he tells everyone, go back to your to your city of, of biological origin. So where do you, where's your family from? Go back to that city. And so uh, um, Joseph and Mary are very distant cousins, but they're both from that same family. And they go and they go back to, to where they're from, to Bethlehem. And so think about it. They go on a, on a donkey, and she's about nine months pregnant almost. And so any slip of the donkey, and, and uh, I think about that. I think about how 90 miles on a donkey the monkey slips, the monkey, the donkey slips, <laughs> I'm tired, sorry. The donkey slips and falls and, and uh, uh, Mary falls and, and so the prophecy doesn't happen. But when Jesus is born anyway, God is taking care of all the little details. And, and look at the, at the end there of verse 2, it says, Whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. This is talking about how Jesus existed before that, that this isn't a, a brand new baby. This isn't just uh, God choosing Jesus like he's choosing a prophet or choosing a Moses. No, that Jesus is God. That, that this is coming from before, from times of old, from everlasting. God has always, or Jesus has always existed. He will be incarnated. He will become a man. And so the Jewish leaders, they believe this. And, and so this is that. The Jewish leaders, they believe in the Messiah. He was going to be born, and it tells in their own books that it's going to be born in in uh, uh, in Bethlehem. And so, think about the story of Christmas that the 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 the, the Magi or the the wise men show up, and they come looking for the King of Jews. And King Herod, who he think he called himself the King of Jews, um, he finds out about this, and he wants to know, okay, where where is this King of Jews going to be born? So he asks his scholars. And his scholars go directly back and they quote to him from Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and they say, well, it says here that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And so, again, it's said that the scholars themselves, they heard about the scriptures, they read the scriptures themselves, they heard about the wise men coming from all the way from, from the, the land of Babylon. They came and looking for, for, for this king of the Jews that he was going to be born. And, and so they couldn't walk the five miles from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. To go see if it was true. And they were, they were too busy with their religious practices. They were too busy being religious. They were too busy. All the, all the, the Pharisees and, and, and the... And the uh, uh, all the religious lawyers and these scholars, they, they could have at least said, oh, maybe, just maybe, the Messiah is, is almost going to be born. We should go check this out. And sadly, these same scholars, these same Pharisees today, they're still waiting for the Messiah. And they're not even looking because Jesus has already come and Jesus has resurrected. And so look at chapter 6, verse 8. This verse right here, Micah 6, verse 8, 
This sums it all up. This sums it all up. This is, this is one of the most important verses in the whole Bible. He has shown you a man what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's it. So those three. If we would do these three things, if we do justly, help others, bless others, take care of others, love mercy, be merciful, and to walk Humbly with your God. There. We would live a good Christian holy life. And, and so, so again, it sums it up like Jesus summed it up. What is the greatest commandment? Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength, and, and do the same to others, and do the same with your neighbor. And so, so Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Hopefully, you're, you, if you have your own Bible, hopefully you're able to uh, uh, circle that one and, and highlight it. That's one of the most important verses. In chapter 7, verse 14, it says, shepherd your people with your staff, speaking of the Messiah, the good shepherd, the flock of your heritage, who dwell soli sol solitarily in, wood, in a woodland, in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead, as in the days of old. Verse 18, who is a God like you? Remember when Micah, Micah meant, who is God like you? And so Micah is using that. He's just kind of playing with his own name. He's saying, who is Micah? Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity, pardoning sin, and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever. Because he delights in mercy. Amen. That's why he says, who is a God like you? And so um, he finishes in, in verse 20. You will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham. In other words, to the people of Israel, which you have sworn to your fathers from days of old. So, God cast all of our sins into the sea. Verse, verse uh, uh, I, I skipped 19 accidentally. But look at verse 19. He will again have compassion on us. He will subdue all our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. That's where we get that idea that the Lord throws all our sin to the depths of the, the, depths of the sea, to the darkest place, never to be seen again. Uh, someone once wrote, he cast all our sins into the sea, and he puts up a sign that says, no fishing allowed, so that no one will ever go back and get, get our old sins again, bring them back up. God doesn't care. God, he has forgotten about it. He has forgiven us for it. Uh, God has a big eraser. Amen. And so, uh, again, the trials are producing something, as I said earlier. So... Quickly, we'll finish the, the, the next two, just three chapters in each. The book of Nahum. This is a prophecy that Jonah, we said it last week, Jonah would have loved to preach. He would have loved to, remember Jonah hated the people of Nineveh. Jonah did not want to go prophesy to Nineveh, and so he would have loved preaching when Nahum had to preach. Jonah had preached to Nineveh uh, 150 years before, and he preached the message of judgment. Uh, it was a quick one. He came in to Nineveh and he said, in 40 days, God is going to judge all of your evil, you Ninevites, and he will destroy it, destroy the city. Uh, but the whole city, remember, there was a great revival, the greatest revival in, in the history of humanity because uh, in one day, it says 160 or 600,000 people in, in Nineveh, they all returned to God. And so they all repented, the whole city, including the king. And, and sadly, only 150 years passed, and now they're back. And historians say they were even worse than they were before. And so uh, in, in chapter 3, or chapter 1 of Nahum, there's only three chapters, but chapter 1, it says the burden or the message that he has to give, these prophets, they felt it as a burden uh, against Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshites. So well, where is Elkosh? Where Nineveh is from, um, some have have uh, where where Nahum is from. Excuse me. Some have said that it's uh, you've heard of uh, Capernaum, Capernaum, where Jesus did most of his ministry from. Uh, Capernaum, Capernaum. So the town of Nahum. So some believe that that's where he was from. Uh, the book begins by describing God's character. This is why. The sin of Nineveh has to be judged because of who God is. So, verse 2, God is jealous and the Lord avenges. 
There's a lot of people that have an issue with saying that God is jealous, that God is a jealous God, that God avenges. Uh, so much that some, again, don't like to, to read the Old Testament because they say that's a different God. That our God is a God of love, a God of, a God of grace, that God would never do that. Uh, but then, the New Testament, the cross would not make sense. Because if God is a God of love, why would he allow his own son, or only a God of love, but not a, a, a jealous God and a, and a judge also? Then his own son would not have died on the cross. This is why Jesus' pain on the cross had to happen because he is the same God of the Old Testament. The Old Testament God, the same God of the New Testament, he is a jealous God. Now, think of jealousy uh, in the most purest form. Um, One time I heard a, 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 uh, an interview of Oprah, Oprah Winfrey, and, and she, was, she was saying this. She said, I was at a church one day, and, and the preacher said, God is a jealous God. She said, from that moment on, she said, I, that, I, I cannot believe in that God. How can God, who is good and loving, how can he be jealous? That doesn't make sense. That's only humans are jealous. That, that, that isn't. So a lot of what Oprah teaches today is, is based on that. That's, that's a whole different God. That's not our Bible God. But when we think of jealousy, it's not like a human is jealous, like a man is jealous that he is, you know, gets angry because he thinks that his wife is talking to someone else. Or his girlfriend is talking to someone else. No. It is that jealousy of a father to a daughter to a, to a son that will protect it, will protect their daughter. Protect their son. Um, that will do everything possible because a father knows best. A father uh, knows that... Um, uh, that his even though his wrath will take a long time before he acts, if, if God can punish Israel, he will also punish a city like Nineveh. And so God calls or, or God is called jealous in the Bible eight different times. God wants no rivals. God does not want us to be worshiping anything else. He gave the blood of Jesus so that we can be his forever. And so if we if we worship any other God. It's, it's, a, it's so offensive to him. It's, it's like, again, it's like a very loving father that, imagine, I could just imagine, what if my daughter, after me, my whole life, being the best dad possible to her, and my daughter just says, I don't want anything to do with you. And she just goes off and does whatever else. There is this, this, this loving jealousy in me that says, no, I, I know what's best for you, daughter. I know what's best for you. I love you. I've, I've taken care of you. You're mine. And so I will do, so... Now, an earthly jealousy would be me being jealous because she had a boyfriend someday and a husband someday and me acting, acting uh, that's sinful jealousy, that's not right. But when she's dating, there's going to be a good, godly, loving uh, jealousy that, no, I know what's best for you, daughter, and, and I want to make sure that uh, you, you have the best husband ever in the future, and so I will do everything possible for that. And, and that's, a, that's a really little, small example compared to the, to the loving jealousy of God for us. He is a jealous God. He, is, he doesn't want us to, to give our worship to anything or anyone else. He, he created us. He died for us. He loves us. So, so, so he wants, he knows what's best for us. So when, whenever we, we go off and we worship, and again, we're not worshiping idols, but we're worshiping money. We're worshiping people. We're worshiping ourselves. He will be, we become jealous. And so whenever we rebel against God, this is why he, this is offensive to him. Verse 7, the Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place. The darkness will pursue his enemies. This is where um, here Nahum is bringing up the Babylonians. So it's not the Assyrians anymore, but the Babylonians are going to come in. Chapter 2, the shields of his mighty men are made red. Literally, the Babylonians would, would paint their shields red with, with dye. They would dye it red uh, so that the enemy could not see their blood on their shields. And so, so they would just cover it all in red so that even if they were, uh, if they had blood on them, they wouldn't be able to see it. So literally, they're talking about the Babylonians. Uh, and so the chariots come with flaming torches in the days of his preparation, and the spears are brandished. And so, verse 9, take spoil of silver, take spoil of gold. There is no end of treasure or wealth of, of every desirable prize. 
He's saying, you have all of these riches as a nation, as a kingdom. You have all of these blessings from me that I gave you, says God. But none of it matters because she is empty, desolate, and waste. The heart melts and the knees shake. Much pain is in every side and all their faces are drained of color. If you go to San Francisco today, uh, in the capital or in the, in the main city hall there, uh, up on the on the main on their building, right on top, it's the goddess of money. I forget what the name of it is, but it's the goddess of money, and 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 so it's just perfect representation that as as humans we we would we would say that we don't worship other gods, but we sure do trust in money. We trust in finances. We trust in wealth, and and so. Um, the same message is coming not only to Jerusalem, not only to Israel, but it's coming to us today also that we need to recognize that we need to trust in God. We need to trust in God and worship Him. And so chapter 3 of Nahum, it says, Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. Its victim never departs. Remember, this is the message to the Ninevites, not Jerusalem, but to, to the uh, the, the pagan city of uh, Nineveh. Uh, the noise of a whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots, horsemen charged with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses. So that the Babylonians are going to come, and this is how many. There's going to be bodies everywhere, he's saying. So the Ninevites, they were known this is how wicked they were. They were so brutal. You've ever sat in a, in a nice leather chair, right? A nice leather chair with, made out of, of, uh, of the leather of a cow, probably. And, and so it feels nice. And everything. Guess what they would do? They would take their enemies and they would skin the humans, the enemies, and they would make furniture out of the skin of other humans. Yeah, this is how this is how wicked they were, and then also remember they they were uh, outside of their of the walls of the city. It was just covered in skulls, so they would just throw the skulls outside of the city, so that when other enemies would try to come and attack them, they would show up to their walls and just see them surrounded by skulls and say, "Ah, we don't want anything to do with them." And and so, but this is again Nahum uh, prophesying to them that God will punish them also. And, and, and just think about it. Um, why, why is this book, why is a whole book dedicated to uh, not Israel, but uh, to a pagan nation? Because, because by this time, they were just a pagan nation. 150 years before, when Jonah preached to them, they repented and they converted to the Jewish God. They were, they were, they were believers. They were, they were not Christians yet. There was no Jesus yet, but they were, they were believers in, in, in Yahweh, in God. And so... So by this time, God is judging them as his. And so God is because they turned from, from, from God. And so now he's judging them and this is his people also. And so just because they weren't Israelites doesn't mean that, that they wouldn't receive judgment also. Well, uh, Nahum says this. This is very sarcastic. Sarcastic. And don't get offended, ladies. He's calling the, the soldiers. Surely your people, your soldiers in your midst are women. He's saying, you, you, you just compare, you're, you're just weak. He's saying, you're weak. So this is very sarcastic. You soldier, your soldiers are women. And so uh, the gates of your land are wide open for your enemies. Fire shall devour the bars of your gates. And verse 19, your injury has no healing. Your wound is severe. All who hear news of you will clap their hands over you. They're going to celebrate. For upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually? Again, I wonder if there will be ever any, any other nations that will will celebrate. Uh, remember, sadly, remember when 9-11 happened? Uh, America was was just uh, just in mourning. I mean, more than 3,000 people died in one day. And uh, that same day, though, on other other parts of the world, there were little kids just celebrating uh, outside of the streets of of. Uh, of Iran and Pakistan and Afghanistan, they were just celebrating everybody. Oh, because America was was attacked, and and so so what what he's saying here, he's saying, you have so you have created so many enemies around you, uh, uh, Nineveh, that God's going to punish you, and the rest of the nations are going to clap their hands over you. 
So lastly, the book of Habakkuk. This, this Habakkuk, we call him the confused prophet. Because his question is, the question that most people ask. They they've did a survey. If you could ask God any question, and, and you knew he would answer you, what question would you ask? And this is the question. How can a good God allow evil to exist? Right? That's every time people ask that. Uh, or why do good people suffer? Yes. I mean, God, God should punish the, if, if, uh, if a murderer or rapist gets cancer, well, praise the Lord. But if a child gets cancer, why God? Why do you allow good people to suffer? And so uh, this is the question that, that Habakkuk is asking. Why, why is it that the good people are going to suffer? And so, verse 1 of chapter 1, the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry? He says, I'm living holy, God. I'm a good servant of yours. I'm crying out to you, and you will not hear me. Even cry out to you violence, and you will not save me. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering the violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless, and justice never goes before. Whoever goes forth, for the wicked surround the righteous, therefore perverse judgment proceeds. So the sin is a, the sin, there's obviously sin among his people, says Habakkuk. I know that I recognize that there's sin uh, among my people. And, and they're sinning, and God, you're not acting. You should you should come against them and, and act and judge them. And uh, uh, and so we know that there was a time when Israel was holy and, and there was good kings, but now everybody's evil. And, and so the prophet is asking, when, God, when are you going to finally uh, uh, just punish, punish people? Again, there's, there's uh, a little bit kind of like what the sister was saying, uh, that there might be some false prophets today that are saying, oh, God, just you come and destroy these cities. And... It's kind of like those people, those pastors, that as soon as there's uh, there's an earthquake somewhere, or there's uh, uh, Hurricane Katrina or something, the first thing people say, oh, it's God punishing them. Oh, it's God punishing California. God punishing. Well, well, this is Habakkuk saying, why aren't you going to punish Israel? I'm waiting. So as Christians, we're asking God for God's mercy, not for God's punishment. We're asking for God's blessing. We're asking for God to... Forgive us. We're interceding for, or before he brings wrath on San Francisco, on Vegas, on Stockton. We're saying, God, please uh, bring salvation to our city. Please bring forgiveness. And so verse 5, look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. This is God, now the Lord, speaking to Habakkuk, answering this question. For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans the Babylonians, a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. He's saying, oh, have a look. I'm going to do something about all this, and I will bring an enemy army to destroy the city. Don't you worry. It, it is going to happen. But that's not what Habakkuk expected. He's saying, I'm praying, and God will simply send revival. He's saying, I'm going to pray. And, and uh, uh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it the right way. I'm going to pray, Lord, and you're going to bring revival, and everything's going to be calm, and everything's going to there's going to be forgiveness for the land. But God answered by saying, "No, I will punish them, and they will be punished for seventy years. They will be slaves in Babylon." And so the the, the prophet's second question, verse twelve: Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my holy one? We shall not die. O Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. O Rock, you have marked them for correction. Says, but we are your people, God. How do you how how do you use them to punish us? You're going to use the Babylonians to punish us, saying we we're yours. And and again, as I read this, it's 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 like us praying right now and saying, God, please bring revival over Stockton. Please bring revival over our nation. Please forgive our nation. Please protect it. But at the same time, there are so many churches that are so obsessed with worldliness. They're so obsessed with sin. And I'm talking about churches, Christians. And, and, uh, and this is the equivalent. Imagine if we're praying. And we're saying, God, forgive us. God, forgive us. God, help us. And God, because God is still a, a, a just God, and God will still bring judgment. That all of a sudden, God sends ISIS 
to come and, and punish. God uses an ISIS or terrorism to come and punish America. Imagine if that would happen. That's the, the equivalent of what happened then. It's like us saying, no, 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 God, those are our enemies. Why would you allow this to happen? No, you would never do that, God. But again, it's God being patient, God sending warning after warning after warning, God being patient with his people. And he specifically saying, if, if you uh, uh, humble yourself and repent and turn from your wicked ways, then I will hear you from heaven. I will heal your land. I will, I will forgive you. I will revive you again. But until then, if nothing happens, this is the consequence. And so chapter 2, in verse 1, he's saying, until then, live by faith. Because he's still speaking to Habakkuk, a godly man. And he's speaking to us. Those of us that are, for example, here tonight, saying, Lord, we, we want to do what's right. We want, we want to... Uh, 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 simply honor you in the midst of all the sin that surrounds us. So he's saying, I will stand my watch. And set myself on the rampart. This is Habakkuk saying, I'm going to still stand up and watch to see what he will say to me. And I will answer when I am corrected. So basically he's, he stopped. Habakkuk stopped all his questioning. This is what we need to do in the midst of all our questions and all our doubts. We need to stop and remind ourselves who God really is. So he's just, okay. And then the Lord answered me and said, verse 2, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may, may run who reads it. So he's saying, what I just told you, make sure you write it down and, make, and let, the, let the Israelites know that there is an enemy that's going to come and destroy it. And verse 3, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. It's not going to happen just yet, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come it will not tarry. Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. So in the same way for us, he's saying, I, we read Revelation. We read, we've read all the prophecies. Even as we study Isaiah and, Jud and, and uh, Jeremiah and Daniel, we've read Daniel. These, some of those prophecies were for those times, but a lot of them, they still haven't happened yet. There will be a, die, a day of judgment. There will be all these things that will happen. The last days will come. And so it's saying they will not. They, they will tarry right now. They're taking a while, but they will surely come, he says. Uh, this is one of the most important verses in all the Bible. Uh, Paul refers to it three times in his writing. Uh, this is what he's saying. We, you've read it before. But the just shall live by faith. So that's what we're doing now. We're still going to live by faith. We don't know exactly how tomorrow's going to happen. And, and like, I always, like I always share with you, if you ever have someone telling you this is exactly how it's going to be, how do they know? And if they start telling you uh, this is the date when Jesus is coming back, Jesus even, even said, not even the Son of Man, not even Jesus, the Son of God. So he did, not, he did not know when he was here on earth, the day or the hour. Says, then how can we somehow find out the date? Remember, Jesus was supposed to come back on the, on May twenty first, twenty eleven. It's already twenty twenty. It's already going to be twenty twenty one. Ten years later, and and the Lord is still tearing. He's still waiting. He's still being patient. Uh, but until then, we shall live by faith. We're still going to trust Him. And so God is saying, "I will judge evil. I will judge evil. I, this this is going to happen." Um, because there is, there is a, a, a consequence to it all. Um, but the future will be good. And that's what, that's what I, I keep sharing with you because this is what God keeps saying. And he tells us the same thing. He told us on Sunday that there is a consequence to our sin, but the future is still good. The future, there is still hope for all of us. Verse 14. For the earth will be filled. With the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters co cover the sea. But in the meantime, live by faith. The deliverance, the, the freedom, it will come eventually. And let's finish with chapter 3, and then we're done by simply reading this. I just want to read it to you. It says, O Lord, I heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Verse 16. Go all the way down to 16. When I heard, my body trembled, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones, 
And I trembled in myself, that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. We, we need to, as, as Christians, as people that, that uh, again, may we not be Christians that simply say, well, I know I'm going to heaven. I got my ticket paid. Praise the Lord. I'm waiting for Jesus to come back. Or, or I die so I can go to heaven. That's it. No, we, we, we must... As when we pray, we're not just going to pray, God bless my life and bless and take care of my family. I hope that we get to the level of, of our Christian maturity and our journey with God that when we think of anyone, that one person going to hell, that it hurts us, that, that, it, that is, as the prophets were saying, a burden, that, it, that, it, that we feel it, that we, that, that we can't be okay. Um, that there's this, this pain in our gut. Jesus, when he saw the the, or, or when he tells the story of the Good Samaritan, there was a man on the side of the road that was, that was uh, robbed and, and beaten up and, and uh, the thieves uh, beat him up, that the Good Samaritan was walking by and that he had pain in his stomach. There's a specific word, that he, a compassion. But the word compassion, it says there's this, this pain in your gut that you can't keep going on with your normal life because there's pain in you. And for us as Christians, we can't go on with our normal life, just everything's fine and their comfort, when we know that there are people dying and going to hell. And we need to do something about it. And that's what the, the prophet Habakkuk is saying here. He says, I, I felt the pain in my bones. He says, I trembled in myself to know that there will be a day of judgment. And that not only our family, but our neighbors, or, or the people in our city, in the world, that, that there are people that will suffer because... Either they didn't hear about Jesus or they simply rejected Jesus. And we need to do something about this. And so he's, he's saying this. He says, uh, I know that this is coming. But, verse 17, this is, again, the beautiful gospel. This is the beautiful message of God that there's always hope. But, verse 17, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no fruit, fruit Though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy, I will joy, I will find joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. Oh, you're gonna run quickly. And he will make my make me walk on my high heels. And that's how he finishes. Have a good by saying, all of this is happening. And, and, I, and I feel it, and I know that this is, so again, as Christians, I, there was a lady that, that, that would come to our church uh, a few years ago, and uh, she, she told me, Pastor, I just stopped going to your church because uh, uh, you, just, you just bring up so much negativity. You, you bring up so many sad things. At the time, she came during a series, I was, I was talking about this, about us helping the homeless, helping the poor. Helping the the, uh, the the people in our community and also people in other nations that need help and and uh, I, sh I showed some videos of some children that were sick and, and needed help of course right but but she chose to only look at the problem and so yes as Christians uh, there's this thing uh, that the world calls uh, it calls compassion fatigue you ever heard of that yes. that that right now people have compassion fatigue because. There's so many organizations, and there's so many, so much need, and, and you got to take care of the whales, and you got to take care of the homeless, and you got to take care of the uh, of, of the old, and and this and that, and you, and you just get compassion fatigue. Before you get Habakkuk, he he knew how to do it. This is what it means to be a Christian. Yes, you see the reality that there are actual needs, but you stop, and the Lord is your strength. And so, so, so yes, uh, uh, there's there's so much need. There's so much, yes, we still live in Stockton. We don't ignore it. We know the problems, but the Lord is my strength. Yes, I will rejoice in the Lord. So again, at the end of this, when you suffer, instead of saying, how can I get, how, how can I get out of this? In the middle of the, of the suffering, in the middle of the trials, instead of just simply, yeah, man, that's, you enjoy it? Praise the Lord. That's what I said with, with the Apostle Paul. Man, who said that? I didn't tell you. Yeah, sister. That because there's three levels of Christianity. The first level is is uh, uh, the, the God why God why why is this happening? Why is this happening? And then there's the 
You know what? Even though this is happening, uh, I'm still going to worship you, God. I'm going to trust in you, and I don't know why. I don't know why this is happening, but I'm still going to trust in God. And that's where most, most Christians were, were, were at that level. But then there's that Apostle Paul Christianity. There's that faith where you say, where you say, God, there's problems. Praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, there's, there's problems. Thank God, because first of all, we know that there's a devil that is trying to attack you, and it's just like you, sh- you get kind of proud because it's like you want to attack me. All right, that means I'm worth it. And so, praise the Lord. And so, your sister, go for it. Exactly. Amen. To, to, that's what he says. Praise me. <laughs> Amen. 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 And that's the, the Amen. Amen. And so that, that's what that's what it means by to live is Christ, to die is gain. We're good. And so so the apostle Paul's in prison and he says, I thank God for my chains. Because of my chains, more people are coming to Christ. And so sometimes it might, it, it, it might be difficult, and that's why I said that. that. That's the third level. That one's hard. But it's like, because of my sickness, because of my problem, because of my need, I'm still going to worship. And because of that, people are going to see that as a testimony, and they're going to come to Christ because of that. So, so instead of saying, how can I get out of this? What can I get out of this? Uh, you know, what, what can I learn from this? What can I, what, in the middle of all this, I'm still going to get to know God more. And so, again... When we read these 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 prophetic books, oh, uh, I hope that it opens up our eyes to the reality that God is just, and if we don't repent, judgment does come. But at the same time, God is also a God of hope and a God of forgiveness, and that that if we do repent, there's so much joy, there's so much, there's so many good things that come from it, and so and God is a very patient God, but also a God that the, the judgment will come. And so, let's pray for our nation, let's pray for our city, let's pray for our families. Let's pray for our churches. And so, when, when like, like the Lord said on Sunday, when Christians, when Christians repent of their sins, when Christians start living like, like Christ, that's when, when the change comes. And so, let's pray. Father, again, we thank you tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for challenging us this way tonight once again. Thank you, my God, that these prophecies of 3,000 years ago, Lord,